So hello, uh, my name is Rob Taylor from Dads in Business, where we aim to help busy dads, busy working dads, bring the best of themselves to work and to home. Uh, often we talk about we lose sight of self, we are present with our kids, but we're not really present. And we'll talk about that a lot today through the help of our very special guest, uh, all the way from over in uh, Melbourne, Australia, um, Michael Ray, who is uh, a solo dad. Um, I'm going to let him introduce himself way better than that uh, and tell us more about what he does, his mission and his purpose and the lessons that we can all learn um, to be more present with our kids, to engage better, uh, to have better outcomes, I guess, as the, as the family unit as we move forward. So, uh, Michael, good evening to you, sir. I hope you're well. Um, tell us about yourself. Introduce yourself better than I just did. Oh, g'day, Rob. Um... Solo dad, as you mentioned, became a, a dad at the ripe old age of uh, 49. I, I think my head will probably account for the late start and a uh, bit of a shock to the system after a footloose fancy free. Grew up in a heteronormative family where dad was a breadwinner, mum ran the house and it worked beautifully for them. Uh, married their entire lives until dad passed and that was my template for going forward. Worked in a hyper-masculine uh, area as a bodyguard for a lot of rock stars that came through Melbourne and a strength and conditioning coach all the way up to our top level elite sports which is our AFL football uh, teams so pretty blokey bloke and uh, you know grew up in the boys don't cry and all the rest of it and then became a dad at the age of 49 and suddenly realized that uh, the stories I've been telling myself about who I was and what I thought a good father would be from the outside it, it used to look uh limiting uh, you know things you couldn't do was what it seemed to be to me i couldn't go surfing and i couldn't travel and all those things and instead i found it's given me the freedom to cast off the facade and ego and actually discover who i am as a as a man and life's been nothing but joy since oh wow that's uh i mean early doors i think there's some that's an interesting point you make there that, that we've highlighted the things you can't do anymore. And I can connect straight away with that. When I first became a dad, I've got three young boys. Um, goes up the same, love them to bits. But it's the, um, it is that, oh, I can't go out and socialize as much as I, as I used to. I, I can't go to the football like I used to, or I can't do this. And I guess it's to that point that there's a risk we lose our sense of self, right? And, and that disappears. So I'd be interested to know about how you what it, was it a shock to the system when you realized that that you were becoming a dad at 49 um moving from a heavily male focused sort of man up get on with it we do this mentality what was it that, that shook you out of that that made you realize i can't do that anymore and how do i how do i shift that um rob i'd like to say that i was always some um enlightened new age man but um, I gained my clarity through crisis uh, at the same time as what I was working 80 hours a week and, you know, had this mindset that a good dad is a good provider and I had to work hard. My daughter's mother had three children from a previous marriage, so it was supporting the, the whole thing and trying to be as involved and engaged with my daughter as I could. And I, I got a little bit sick. And that went on for a while, but was too busy to go to the doctors. And then at the same time as what uh, my wife and I decided to split, well, she decided to uh, split, I had a small car accident. And after that car accident, I just a routine scan on my neck. They found some pretty frightening things. And the reason why I'd been so tired and run down wasn't just the, the 80 hour weeks. I was pretty sick and my future wasn't guaranteed. And so suddenly, the way I described is my life had become like that house on fire. There were flames leaping through the roof and smoke billowing out the windows. And suddenly I was forced to decide what was I prepared to run back into that house, back into my life to try and save? What was there of consequence that I'd accumulated or achieved up until that point? And the only thing that had any consequence to me was the impact this was going to have on my daughter. The thought of her, because at that stage she was only uh, nine months old, the thought that she may not even know that I exist because it was a 
a little bit of an acrimonious split, but what sort of hole would this leave in her soul growing up knowing she never got to know her dad? And that was where it just suddenly, you know what, impressing the boys, setting records, um, the nights out, all of those things just suddenly didn't matter. And I realised that I was spending my daughter's time from that point forward. So, you know, I understand, you know, we all need to work, but there's a certain point where we go, you know, why am I taking on these extra um, responsibilities and all the rest of it when life's pretty good at the moment, when I have that balance, it, does it always have to be, you know, that um, Instagrammable, LinkedIn, grind, grind, achieve, strive, and all the rest of it for the sake of what, what are we giving up to do it? So that, that was my um, realization, Rob, that yeah, suddenly and, my... And, and, and I hope your health is, is better now. Um, you know, it's, it, I think we, we did some sessions with an organization a while back and one of the comments from one of the, the guys in the room there was, no one lies on their deathbed wishing they had one more meeting. Uh, and I, I sort of connected back to that when you were speaking because it is that burning house syndrome. What would you go back into rescue? It's not your meetings or calendars, is it? It's, it's going to be, I want to, I want to do more here. And there's a risk, I guess, that as, as busy dads get more busy and busy is the root of success. We sleepwalk into the fact that we neglect our kids growing up. So for those that don't have, I guess, that life changing moment or that, that stop where you do change that perspective, how can we how can we look to challenge our challenge our, our I guess status quo to make us look at things differently? Is, is this what you do now? I guess tell us about your mission and your purpose now as as a solo dad to, to help others. And is it around that topic? Um, the, the main thing that organisations seem to reach out for Rob is trying to increase the uptake of parental leave amongst the men. At the moment, I think it's about ninety one percent of all parental leave is taken by women. So we need to look at the reasons why. And for too long, because men have remained silent, the narrative has been that men are either unwilling, unable or unsuitable to care for their kids. And none of that is true. So it's been accepted. Well, you know, we've got it there, but they don't use it. A lot of the time it's like Fight Club. Yes, you can take it, but don't mention it. And if you do take it, when you come back, you're going to be teased about it. You know, and so all those little microaggressions so my whole thing is that we all want to be good dads. We're all doing the best we can. But a lot of the times we need to examine what is actually best for our children. And apart from the 20% of children that live in poverty, we don't really um, study the linear progression for income. And I can say without doubt from all of my studies, there's no linear advantage for children growing up with more resources and more income once they're out of poverty. So I say to the dads, if you were to sacrifice some of your career advancement, and it's a temporary um, sacrifice, and I, I don't even like the term sacrifice, because mm -hmm. it means yeah. it denotes you're giving up something of great value for something of lesser value. But if you could just put a pause on your progression in, in your career for a little while, because I think the average family is two point something children. So let's say three children one year off for each of them, that's three years total. Your children between the age of kindergarten and finishing high school or year 12, only 14% of their waking hours are in formal education. So most of their learning, most of their sense of self is done out there within the family. So what example are you setting for them as dads? So the Traditional one used to be the breadwinner and the disciplinarian, so provider. We're definitely providers, but we're providers of nurturing and self-esteem. Discipline, the proper definition of discipline is teach. So when we discipline our children, we teach them. We teach them, we instill values. So dads are very big on that. Dads with daughters, even more so. Dads with sons, really important as well. So that's why I say to dads, if, you, if your goal is to be the best dad and achieve the best outcomes for your children, that doesn't necessarily mean working yourself to death. And I'm not trying to um, dissuade guys because that's why I say we find great fulfillment and satisfaction in our careers and our jobs. And, you know, it's not an all-encompassing 
thing, but we can't be all of one thing and none of another and none of the other. We need to be both. Yeah, no, it, it's it's interesting. I'd like to touch on that. Um, you picked up about some research you've been doing about it. it's not a linear progression. I, I assume that means the more you earn doesn't naturally correlate to being a better child. Is that is that what you're saying there? Yeah, the, the only the only uh, benefit we can see is um, finishing uh, education and entering uh, university, but there's a disadvantage for the more wealth within a family, the less likely your child is to finish university. And it might be because it's not held in such great importance because, well, I've got dad and mum's money to fall back on, I've got connections, I don't need this qualification. So it seems the more humble your beginnings are, the more likely you are to finish your education. But uh, educational attainment entering university is higher for some income. But as far as social, mental, behavioural, um, literacy, all the rest of it, there's a, a rock solid, provable link between fathers' involvement and their children. Mm, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? And I guess it's it's so hard to to break that barrier. I mean, there's there's a lot of conversation over here in the UK as as there is where you are about that equal equal parental leave, and it seems to come more from. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but my, my perception is it, it comes from more of the, the mom's lens. We need this so women can better their career. We need this so women can do this, so we can have equality for women. And I am not doubting there should be equality for women. But is the lens perhaps misguided here? Do we need to say we need equal parental leave so dads can be better at home? And, and the argument comes from the other side. Do you see the same? 100% Rob, I, I honestly believe that the vast majority of equality, what we call equality initiatives, are counterproductive. What we've done is we've tried to remove all of the barriers for mums entering the workforce while doing their caring. And men are facing the same problems now leaving the workforce to take up the caring. So the minute we hear oh, affordable childcare is a women's issue, well, it's I'm sorry, but it's just not. I was paying more in childcare than what I was for my mortgage initially. And, and that's what forced me to restructure my career. So it's a parental one. But unless you're a single parent, which then it affects men and women equally, if you're in a couple, it affects the family budget. And what we're doing is we're not um, prioritising the men's career. We're prioritising the amount of income that comes into the house. Dad earns more, fair enough, he gets it. So the gender pay gap pays a lot of it. But the easier we make it for women to increase their responsibilities outside of the house while maintaining their responsibilities within their house, we just reinforce the status quo. So a, a lot of organisations have got a parental leave scheme, which is just maternity leave rebadged. And here in Australia, our uh, entitlement to what we call partner pay, which is you know dads, because mum has to recover from the thing, is two weeks at minimum pay. So right there, mum has to recover from the birth. So right in that instant, dad goes off to work and dad says, right, I want to be the best partner I can. So I'm going to work harder to bring home more resources. I'll work even better because mum's doing her bit at home. So I want to be fair and do even more within my uh, workplace. What happens is dad gets home, here's bub. Bub doesn't settle. Well, mum's used to, used to it. This is what you do straight away we've assumed the role of the assistant. But there's so much more that goes into it, Rob. We grow up in a society that says only a mother's love, maternal instinct, mother knows best. So straight away we think, and I was exactly the same, and not just because my daughter's mother had had three kids, so she'd had time in role, but I just thought, well, women just know this stuff. It's more natural. It's more connecting. And it's just not, but that does such a disservice to the devotion and the hard work of parenting to think that somebody, oh, you're just naturally gifted at it. And, you know, when I say rather than mother knows best, it's simply practice makes parenting progress. The more you do, the more you get. My mum raised three kids. Two of them turned out okay. Oh, I was a bit, you know, <laughs> dodgy. But she couldn't settle my daughter as good as I could because I'd had that time in role. And while we say... We get so much advice. 
you know, from everyone coming, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that, you read books, this is how you do it. None of them take into account the unique characteristics and personality of our child. You've got a few. I guarantee you parent them exactly the same with different responses. You know, they've got different personalities. So it's not down to the parenting, it's down to the child a lot of the times. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting is that, that leave. And I think you referenced about uh, you get a couple of weeks off in Australia. I think it's very similar over, over here. The last time I was in employment, and I've said this many times, I, I had our first child while I was still employed before I worked for myself. Um, I had my paternity leave, which was two weeks. Um, you go back on day 15 or whatever, back to the office, and they treat you like you've had a holiday. So it's almost like, how was your holiday? It's like, yeah. well, I've not slept. I've been trying to figure out what on earth this parenting thing is. I don't, I don't know who I am anymore. Um, I've got a two week old human being who wasn't here a fortnight ago. And I've had to walk out on my wife who's struggling with that two week old to come back to this office. So don't tell me I've had a holiday. Exactly. <laughs> and, and it's that perception, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. a real challenge. And, and it does, it can do so much damage to the relationship. There's overwhelming evidence that shows that dads who are actively involved pre-birth, so with all the scans and appointments and all of those other things, uh, extra involved after the birth as well. But there's also evidence that shows that the more involved a father is pre-birth, post-birth, the more successful the relationships, the less likely you are to end up separated. So that beginning phase that, you know, we talk about the first thousand days being so important for the child. It's so important for the family. And we've got to get rid of this, you know, women become mothers. You know, it's, women don't simply become mothers, people become parents. Men suffer perinatal depression. As you say, you lose your sense of self. You're worried about your wife's well-being, you're worried about your child's well-being, so you don't say anything because, well, it's not about me, because if you do say something, we shout it down as men. And yet here in Australia, seven out of nine every suicides are men. And, you know, we get told to toughen up, not only by other men and get uh, teased on these microaggressions, we cop it from women as well. Well, it's not about you. What about your wife? She's gone through booze. She's gone... And if dad's struggling, guess where the load falls? If dad hits obstacles, friction or speed bumps in his efforts to be an involved, engaged father, guess who it falls on? And that's why we're where we are today, Rob. There's just been this myopic approach of how can we help mums? Well, it should be how can we help families? Because that's where the children thrive and that's where we need to be. Mm, yeah, and, and just on that sort of perceptions and stigma piece, I am... Um... When I first mentioned about setting up the Dads in Business project, there were, there were, you know, on the whole, women were supportive of it. Yes, this is definitely needed. But there was the, I guess, the minority who did tag me in things and say, well, what about moms? Harder for us. It's harder for us. So like, why does it have to be a competition? Why does exactly. it have to be harder for one than the other? Why can't we just say, look, these are issues, whether you recognize them or not, they exist. If you ignore them, these issues still exist. Yeah, the research we did through um, coming out of COVID uh, with a sample from around, around the world suggested that dad guilt was up, dad anxiety was up, dad's waking up with a, a, a waking sense of dread, overwhelm, because as you say, they're taking everything on. I need to look after the house. I need to get more money. I need to be the child carer. I need to look after my, to my wife. I need to make sure the house is tidy. It's no wonder you know, there's this silent, this silent sense of anxiety that's going around. And until we mention it, no one speaks about it. And it's yep. no wonder it, that, it, you know, like you over there, I think male suicide here is three times more prevalent in men than in women. Mm. There's reasons for this. Yeah, 100%, 100%, Rob. And that's why I say it comes back to our children. Our children do better. And I, I speak with a lot of dads who are separated. And so they're not the, the main carer. They have every other weekend. And that's why, And or I have a lot of mums saying, well, I hear all these benefits that fathers provide. I don't have a, a husband or a father in, in my daughter's life. Is she going to be all right? And that's why I'd say to them, there are father figures everywhere. 
my daughter has a tribe, wonderful tribe of women around her as well that uh, that do it. But we just need to move away and realize we're all together. The last chapter in my book is actually uh, entitled Ubuntu, which is the African thing of all together as one to go forward. And sadly, a lot of the equality debate has become like a football match with sides to be barracked for and against. You know, as you just mentioned, you know, oh, we have it worse with this. We have it worse. And that's why I say, if you have it bad, it impacts us. If we have it bad, it impacts you. So we need to get rid of this. You know, for some reason, parenting is the last bastion of contemporary society that we haven't tried to remove the gendered lens of, of bygone time off of it. We've got rid of, you know, chairman to chairperson. We've got rid of policeman to police officer. We've got rid of air hostess to steward, air steward, you know, all of these things. But for some reason, mums and dads mothering is, you know, uh, you know, I get called a, an honorary mum and it's no, you know, and even when I get called a good, oh, you're a great dad. No, I want to be a great parent because the bar for the two, the women are judged so much more harshly and men, as long as you're not Homer Simpson and don't drop them too often, oh, you're wonderful. You know, I, I went off to get lessons to learn how to do my daughter's hair. And because I can do a French braid, you would think I'd cured cancer. You know, it's, oh, wow, you're wonderful. And I love a compliment as much as an X-Man, probably even more, Rob, because I'm pretty insecure. But it's, it's patronising for just being a parenting. And that's, I have a lot of my mum friends say, oh, you get all this attention just for doing what women have done all the time. I say, yeah, but I get that attention because there's an assumption that I'm an idiot. And because I'm not an idiot, that's where the praise comes from. Not because... I'm an exceptional parent, not because I've spent, you know, nights sleeping on the hospital floor next to my daughter, not because, you know, I've sat there and listened to her friendship woes at school, not because of all of the parenting stuff that actually matters, but because I'm just not an idiot. I'm amazing. Mm. And it's whose assumptions are they? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, you assume I'm an idiot. I'm not doing anything special here. You assume that I'm an idiot. Yeah. And it's that outward perception, isn't it? That, that must be difficult, I guess, as, as a primary caregiver, as the dad. Um, now, I'm, I'm not that, so I can't speak from experience around that. But there has been people message um, the dads in business community saying, you know, I get funny looks. I get told I shouldn't be doing this. I get asked, well, what, where, why aren't you at work? How did you handle that in the early days? And what advice could you offer to those who are, it was struggling a bit with it because, it, like I say, it's not a space I can speak from, but I'm, I'm very conscious it exists. So I'd love someone like yourself who could offer up some advice for those primary caregiver dads um, in, in early years. And now I think your daughter's getting slightly older, how that evolves to what, what gaps you think there are and what dads can do. Well, the, the thing that brought it all crashing home to me, the thing where I first gained um, some notice in the media was... I was banned from attending or from assisting my daughter at a four-year-old ballet concert. So three-year-old ballet concert was fine. Four-year-old ballet concert, we get all the notifications for the meeting. There's mothers must ensure that they're available for the full, must be in attendance for the full three-hour dress rehearsal. Mothers need to ensure that the lipstick is this shade. Mothers should ensure that the ballet bun is done in accordance with this. Uh, there's a special mummy me ticket offer if you want to bring your other kids and right at the end and of course there are no males allowed in the backstage area so we have the meeting and we go through everything i put my hand up and so hi mitch said the bit about the no males well that's obviously not me and she's gone well no sorry michael it's uh we can't have any males in the backstage area and i said well i was there last year and it wasn't a problem Oh, no, you weren't. Yeah, I, I was. Well, you shouldn't have been. Well, I, I was. But again, why, you know, who's going to look after my daughter? Oh, if you just bring her to the backstage area, we're more than capable of looking after. And I said, yeah, well, that would be fine if you're going to look after everyone's child. And we had a few. And then all of the other mums said, well, we don't have a problem with Michael. And then they said, well, it's a child protection issue. So... I said, well, I've got my working with children check. I've been a swim teacher for 18 years. So I'm trusted with other people's children. And they said, 
well, no, the little girls would be uncomfortable with a male backstage. And I've gone, well, there are two boys in the class. Are they uncomfortable with all the women? And then she said, well, Michael, it's not about you. It's about the children. And I said, well, I'm sorry, Miss Jess, but it's not about the children for me. It's about my daughter. So my daughter can't look around the backstage area and go, with a parent, with a parent, with a parent, with a parent, and here I am on my own. So I didn't create this problem. So you've created it. And at that stage, we we're going through our marriage equality debate. And that's why I said, oh, one day you're going to have two dads, two mums, whatever configuration th there is, and you're meant to be the bastion of contemporary arts, like of liberal thinking. And suddenly you're going, because of your gender, you can't assist your daughter. So I'm willing to work with you to come up. Well, luckily one of the other mums, because the mums all said, well, if Michael's not going backstage, we're not going backstage. But one of the other mums was a friend of a journalist. I got a call that afternoon. The journalist did a big story and it hit the news and it went worldwide. And, you know, it was just about being a parent. And that's what he said. <laughs> it, it's not about me. It's not about men's rights or father's rights. It's about children's rights to be parented by whoever. So exactly the same as workplace. And when I see a lot of women go, oh, there's a thing called role incredul incredulity. So doctors being mistaken as nurses or CEOs being mistaken as secretaries or somebody who's running the meeting being assumed that they would be taking notes. And I say, yeah, that's terrible and it's wrong and it's part of the outdated gender uh, problems. But what about fathers who are assumed that they're babysitting or that they're predators or that they're a risk to children? Does that, is that the opposite side of the exact same outdated rubbish gender stuff that needs to go in the, the bin because I've been abused for using parents' rooms? You know, like, what are you doing in here? Well, I'm changing my daughter, but I'm breastfeeding. More power to you. I should have privacy. There's a curtain there. I don't have to hide behind it. No, you don't. But my daughter needs to go to the toilet. Take it to the male toilets. Really? With no cubicles? No, no, just no. And these things are so common, Rob. It's not just me. And that's what got me started down this path and made me realise how can women ever achieve equality when we go out and you go to a, a change room? Women's toilets have change tables in them, men's don't. We've gone and retrofitted syringe disposals in all the male toilets. So the assumption is that a man is more likely to be a diabetic or a drug user than change a nappy. Really? Like, look at the messaging behind it. So we're out. Bub needs changing. Sorry, wife. Sorry, partner. You've got to do it because the facilities aren't there for me. And that's why I say it's just like electric cars. If we had the infrastructure in, if we had all the charging points in, people would be more likely to do it. So we set the expectation that, gee, look, change tables in men's toilets because my whole mantra is Rob we need to enable encourage and then finally expect men to be held equally responsible for raising the next generation the expectation is really important because once that's there instead of going oh what you're taking parental leave rather than you're kidding you're not taking it why what's wrong rather than you are taking it you know is everything all right is your wife okay yeah I think um I mean, that's a, a shocking example about the about your kids' ballet, by the way. I mean, that's uh, the assumption that all men are paedophiles or something. It's just uh, the, the, how, how that falls into a child protection policy. I, I have no idea. That's, that, that's shocking. I mean, I, I guess you must have to have quite thick skin. Um, uh, rightly or wrongly, you must have to have, to have quite thick skin. Um, does it take time to build that resilience? Did you get a few sneers? Did you think, oh, my God, what am I doing? How can I do this? I, I did, Rob, and still, I'd still feel awkward um, being a dad. My daughter will want a play date and going up to a mum and saying, oh, you know, Charlie would love a play date. And the answer nine times out of 10 would be, you know, fine, I'll see when my husband's available and uh, see if we can organise it. And then it's usually, well, I didn't want to play with him. My daughter wants to play with your daughter, but thanks for the offer. And then even asking for phone numbers because it's it just awkward. But also school runs and stuff like that. Every mum I know has got all of the other mums' numbers on speed dial. So if you're running five minutes late, it's such a great thing to be able to go, 
thankfully I've got some great mums now where I can do it, but because dads aren't involved as much, and I still see it now where the dads congregate and the mums congregate separately. So here in Victoria, the first point of contact and the ongoing support hub for new parents is still called the Maternal and Child Health Centre. So where does dad go? And you know, I've never been made to feel more like a third wheel at these places where their back was actually turned to me speaking to mum. And it's like, really? And you wonder why I've got to defer to mum to seek advice and the load goes back on her because you're not actively trying to recruit me into the process. And it, it just goes on and on and on. We see all the advertising, mum approved, mum's little helper. Um, even my daughter noticed, Rob, at eight years old, we're at the supermarkets and Charlie comes out and says, Dad, why are there no boys on the packets? So I don't know, Bob, I didn't look. So we went out of the car and we got a piece of paper. We went up and down every aisle. We counted 28 products with people on them. Out of that 28 products, only three were men. Everything from dishwashing liquid to laundry powder to, you know, everything, cooking products, baby products, nappies, everything had women on them. So at eight years old, my daughter's being told that domestic duties, your area, because you're on the packet, and, you know, I'm not sure what dad was. Uh, and do you think that does, that does embed in kids at that young age? When they see this, do you think that that almost defines their their role even from that younger age? I think it influences Rob because it's that subversive sublim subliminal type uh, expectation. So you know when when we say uh, you know a lot of things when you say CEO, the picture is a man. When we say scientist or doctor, all the time it's a man. When we say nurse or primary school teacher, it's a woman because that's how it's depicted. So the fact that they depict these, and I think it's a lot more uh, damaging because we call, rightfully call out the um, blatant, obvious, sexist, gendered um, depictions of things. You know, we don't, you know, we call out dumb blonde jokes or, you know, the women's anatomy jokes or, you know, women drivers, anything like that rightfully gets called down. But we still portray dads as bumbling man childs who don't know i've had so many women say to me oh i wish my husband was like you he's absolutely useless and it's like really like have you given him a chance oh no no i couldn't trust him with and that's why i say how do you feel at work when you micromanage through an organization does it make you want to grow into the thing does it want to make you look for more opportunities or do you just shut down and do as you're told and yeah. minimum viable to get through almost isn't it yep. yeah yeah, yeah. No, and, and no that, involvement, no commitment. yeah that expectations thing's interesting isn't it yeah oh i wish more dads were like you mine's useless and it's yeah. it, it, well i'm not saying i've ever heard it said overtly about myself and my wife there is that we call them the should gremlin you know oh he should be doing more he should be at home he should be at work he should be back for bedtime he should be making more money he should control his kids more. He shouldn't let them watch YouTube. He should let them watch YouTube. Ah, he should sling the kids. He shouldn't sling the kids. All these things infiltrate and they set yeah. up this perception of like perfect. And, yeah. and, and, and we say, look, as part of our, our sessions and our work, it's like, look, Mr. Perfect doesn't really exist. No. If we strive for perfection, we're forever setting ourselves up for a fall. Aim to be good enough. Uh, and, yep. and we have a character called Jed, the good enough dad. We think that the bar, uh, I'd be interested to your, your input here. We think the bar for dads is set so high, either explicitly or implicitly. I have to do this because society says so. I've got to be busy, rich, wealthy, and perfect dad. It's too much, isn't it? Yep, 100%. Robert, you know, I've walked away from a a, a fantastic career and I still get people today going yeah when are you coming back we're like don't you miss it don't you know I'd say no like I've, I've literally found if life never changed for me from what it is now I'd be completely satisfied and happy do I have everything that um I thought I wanted no do I have everything that I actually do want now yep if it never gets any better than this Rob it, it's a it's a great thing but it's always temporary and fleeting. So 
my daughter's development at the moment, she's 10 years old. I reckon I've got two more years before I'm not called to hang around with anymore. Then I might go back to a little bit more uh, career wise. So you know, I'm more than happy to tread water at the moment, keep my toe in. I still do a little bit in, in the uh, strength and conditioning field and a few talks around that. But there's nothing wrong with going, you know, this is the stage I'm at. This is what works. But I'm not going to kill myself trying to get stuff just to keep up with the Joneses or to live up to other people's expectations. Because when I normally speak to dads, I do a talk called Reframing Masculinity and Bravery. And that's why I say to them, if somebody said to you, right, I'm going to give you so much for eight hours a day, you wear the uniform, you tow the company line, you speak a certain way, you put up with customers that annoy you and respond politely, you get a certain amount. Then if someone said, right, well, you're on call 24 hours now, so you've got to keep wearing the uniform. You've still got to respond in a way that's expected of you. And, you know, we're going to increase your pay. And everybody said to them, right, you've got a year on call. So they say, right, for one year, how much to wear the uniform, respond in a certain way as expected. And, you know, say, you know, 200 grand, 300 grand, how much? And they put it down and I say, well, why are you giving your life away for free? Why are you wearing that uniform of someone else's expectations and behavioral uh, outcomes and you're doing it for free? So strip back all of the rubbish, go deep within and find what makes you happy. Find where you're at calm, where you're not stressed, where your heart's not beating, where you're present, where you're going, you know what? Gee, in this moment where I'm playing with my daughter, where I'm looking in the rock pools on the beach, I'm not thinking about the emails. I'm not thinking about, you know, next week's work. I'm not thinking about the argument I have with my wife or, you know, my staff member or any of that. How do I get more of this? And that's, that's what I say to guys. That's where the bravery comes in. Be brave enough to go, you know what? This is what I want and I don't care what other people think. Mm. No, it's, it's a really interesting perspective, isn't it? Because I think dad's, like I mentioned, I think earlier on in our chat, our goal and our role is to get busy. I'm a good dad if I'm busy. And that, that is, it's a risk. You know, I, I, I fall into that trap. I, I still go there. It's like, I'm so busy at work. I get stressed. I go home and I, I can take that home with me. I get grumpy. Uh, I wish the kids would go to sleep. But then when they go into their bedroom, I feel guilty because I've not spent the time with them that I wish I'd said and I, I pretend that I want to spend time with if you like but it's a real pull isn't it and, and how do you I guess in the early days and now you know what lessons have you learned from managing that those responsibilities those boundaries did it just happen for you overnight or is it a practice that you've had to put in place to allow you time to focus on work and home uh, money and the responsibilities that come with it the the realization when I got sick that everything can change that so setting long-term plans and long-term goals actually isn't that great a thing so I keep things a lot a lot more short short term but what I normally say to dads is it doesn't have to be a week away or weekends away or full days there are moments between the moments where the magic lays where that connection and that unbreakable bond where when uh, your child comes to you and says dad and instead of like what while you're on your phone just putting the phone down and going right I'm just going to focus if I give a five minutes or however long it takes and then I can come back to it because I've satisfied her need we've seen it in playgrounds and parks and football fields a million times dad 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 look at me look at me look at me that's all they want is our attention for a bit so you know, a lot of the times Charlie will be hovering and she'll be doing things and, you know, I'm thinking like, oh, and I now know that if I give her 10 minutes, go, all right, bub, come on, game a down ball against the wall or, you know, let's go down the street and shoot hoops for 30 minutes. And then after she's gone to bed, I can do all of this. She's happy. She's satisfied. She knows she's important. But those moments between the moments, 15 minutes at the end of each, each night. So at Charlie's bedtime, you know, instead of going, right, she's in bed and I'm gone, I'm on the couch eating my chocolates that I've hidden. It's like, right, she's off the bed and there's at least 15 minutes where it's sitting there. So 
but what happened today? What was the best thing? What was the worst thing? You know, what, you know, what did you, what would you do differently? And just chats and sometimes stuff comes out that I had no idea was there. And it's a magical time of connection. The trip to school, there's a couple of mornings where I make no appointments where I walk to school because we're a little bit rural. So there's a lot of wildlife. So, you know, we walk, walk with a bit of a notepad and pen and note all the different birds and things like that. Car trips, uh, great. You know, dinner at the table, great. So there's just lots of things that you can schedule and you can block out, but it's not a matter of going, you know, I work Saturday morning, so Sunday's a Charlie's day, you know, where she gets to pick what she, what she does. So she picks where we go, what we eat, what we wear. And it used to be really involved when we were little. And now sometimes, oh, Dad, I just want to hang around at home and, uh, you know, play some basketball or do this. Is that okay with you? Whatever you want, bub. Like, you're in charge. So, you know, the moments between the moments, you know, that, you know, little bit of connection that just if you're sitting there watching TV, it's come here, give us a cuddle. Just all of those things, just that connection, Rob. Yeah, and I think, <laughs> Michael, I'm sure you can connect. These are the bane of my life sometimes, yep. the, the smartphone and the devices, the amount of times where, um, yeah, it's like you're, you're scrolling, you're scrolling. It's like, who's emailing me? Come on, no one's going to email me at eight at night, seven at night. If they do, it can surely wait till tomorrow. But yep. because we can't switch from, from work to home and to be present at home, it's a distraction and it's so, I can kick myself. I really can. Yep. And I'm sure there's thousands of others like me but it's like, yeah, just a minute. Hang on, just a minute. I know you've not seen me all day. Just a minute. It's just, oh, God. If my dad did that, I'd be so frustrated. You know, it's... Um... Rob, when you were a kid and your dad actually came out and played with you, whether it be cricket, football or something, like that, how exciting was it? Yeah, hey, dad's here. Mum got the short shrift, you know? Like, you know, mum wasn't exciting because she was there all the time. And that's why I say to dad, there's often an inverse relationship between quantity and quality so just being there all the time doesn't necessarily make make it good for your child you're much better off worshipping the the quality of the time than the quantity so being there for an hour distracted isn't as good as being there for 10 minutes fully involved listening and just wow that's important so she did what to who and now who's not speaking to who oh what are you going to do you know and just because if your children have problems telling you the little things, they're never going to come to you to tell you the big things. And if they're worried about interrupting you, the last thing I want to think of is my daughter at 16 years old out at a party and too scared to call me because something's gone wrong. I want to be the first one she thinks of, gee, I want to get hold of dad. Dad will know what to do. Dad will help rather than, gee, I'm going to be in trouble. Yeah, no, it's um, that whole been there but really been there I think is a is a is a really important differentiator it's like well I've been sat here but I've not been with it yeah, it's, it's, yeah that, that quality versus quantity I think is is a super a lot step of the times, Rob, I used to come home and I'd park the car around the corner and I'd finish off everything that I hadn't got through and I'd sit there in the car for five minutes a couple of calls a couple of emails stuff like that and then it would be right walk in the door and it's just yay let's go what do you want to do and just run them ragged for 10 minutes and then sit down, have an after school snack, have that drink, have a chat, stuff like that. And then they're fine. Charlie will wander off and she's had enough of me. And, you know, it's, it's all great. Mm. We reconvene for dinner and then we talk about stuff at dinner and, and we always do our, what did you learn today? Yeah, oh, it's oh, a great oh, routine so. to try and crack it. I mean, likewise are the kids these days, I don't know what yours like, but you know, my, my three boys, they can all use YouTube. They all watch shouty, horrible, usually Americans, yep. talking nonsense. Uh, and it's real. That's a real tough nut to crack. We've just managed to reintroduce what we call the token time, where they get 30 minutes to do what they want on it, and then it's gone because yeah. it was just getting too much. And it's easy for parents, I think, to say, I'll oh, just go and watch YouTube while I sort something. Just go and do yeah. that while I'm over here doing this. And I think that, that bonding time is certainly something that I need to improve on more. But I think it's incredibly common um, in the in the new modern dad population, if you like. It's too easy to, to get distracted, isn't it? Um, yeah, 100%. I mean, just a couple of bits I want to try and touch on before we before we let you go. Um, one of those would be, tell us about your book. 
but also from your perspective, what can dads do if they, if they were, if, if this is connected with them, it's like, oh, do you know what? I am on my device too much. I do wish they go to bed. I'm always at work. I'm always busy. It's my job to do this. How can dads, would you suggest, start taking responsibility to be more present and actually engage in what their kids are doing for that, to find that quality time? So it's not just reactionary. How can they take steps from today to improve that? Um, and then tell us about your book. Um, it'd be great to, to hear about that as well. Yeah. Um, Rob, my, my thing with guys is do a rough stop take of your time. And it's not actually time spent doing things. It's also time spent doing, uh, thinking of things as well. So how much of the time you switched on about work? And we've got to learn to set firm boundaries. So I don't believe in work-life balance because, you know, I believe in work-life integration. But look at ways where you can go, you know what? I can get an extra 30 minutes um, time with my child in the car if I do the school run. Never be the problem, guys. So if you're going to the boss and saying, gee, I need to, uh, I, I want to do the school run two mornings a week, go there with a solution. So here's the problem. Here's what I want to do. And here's the solution. So on those days, I'll log on a little bit early. So I'll log on at seven. I'll work through to eight. And then from eight to nine, I want to do breakfast, do the school run. I'll be in the office by 9.30 and just be loud. One of my mantras is in one of the presentations is leave loud and leave proud. So, you know, we've all done it before. We've put the jacket on the back of the chair, snuck out to do the school run or the doctors or anything like that, and then snuck back in without saying anything. It sets a wrong example because, again, we need that expectation. We need, well, I've got to do it. Can't your wife do it? No, she, she can't. It's my responsibility. And the reason that my career is important is so that I can provide for my family. So if you think that I'm not committed to my career by taking time to do my family responsibilities, you've got the wrong impression. This career is vitally important because it allows me to provide for my family. So please don't be worried. And you know, I think we need to foster this because we can't facilitate my family life. Guess what's going to happen? I'm going to start looking at how much is turnover and burnout and how productive are men at work when they're thinking about the troubles they've got at home or the separation they're going through or the pull of you know their kid going, Dad, please, it's my sports day. We're in the championship. Can't you get time off? And you know, you're not that productive about being it. Any organiser, if you have managed to become vitally important and irreplaceable within your organisation and not within your family, both you and your organisation are managing the wrong things. They've got to coexist. And that's what we've got to come, come to that realisation. The same with our businesses. A lot of us start off a business thinking, right, well, this will give me the freedom. It's actually the other way around. Until you get right to the end point, it's going to add a lot on. So we all have stretch projects and extra loads and things like that, but it's okay if we can go, you know what? I'm going to work like a madman Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but Friday I'm picking bubs up from school and we're hitting the swimming pool. And, you know, Tuesday, we're going to have a, whether it's taco Tuesday and a movie night, just things like that. Like I said, we just lock out some of that quality time rather than a whole lot of on the phone. Yeah, like I'm at home for two hours every night with my child, but I'm still working. You would be better off being at home one or two nights for one or two hours, fully engaged so that your kids look forward to it. You look forward to it because you can see how much it means to them. And rather than being in the way or an impediment to what you're trying to do, they're actually the focus of it because one day it's all gone, Rob. It's all gone. I think um, something that we see, especially working with smaller businesses and business owners, is we're, yeah, we'll say, what's your calendar look like for next week? And it's basically just a blank calendar. It's like, well, all you're doing is giving all your time away to people who are going to phone you when it's convenient for them. They're going to say, you're working then. Can you come around and visit me then? And they'll just say yes. And then before you realise it, you've filled all your week with everything. And where's the time for you or your family? So the first thing we get them to do is almost circle three important things for the family. Now, one of my business partners, he's, he's incredibly um, structured with it and disciplined with it. 
you know, when he's having breakfast with his kids, they go for a family swim, they play, he plays football on a Monday night, and he's not bothered what work gets, gets inquired about. I can't do it. My work capacity is here, here, and here. And he's shrunk his work capacity to fit to what he wants to do for himself. And it's a really powerful way of doing things. It takes discipline. But I think that's the whole point. We have to be responsible for our boundaries. And if we say ring fence that, ring fence that, ring fence that, yep. it's on us to remove it from our diaries. And what would it take to remove it? It's easy to ignore it and fill it with work stuff. But what does it take to shift it? Yeah. Rob, um, I always finish my talks with this one question. I and mean, just ask yourself this question. What sort of father do you want to be? What sort of stories do you want your kids to tell their kids about you? And what memories do you want them to carry with them throughout life? Then do it because it's never, ever too late to be exactly the parent that your child needs. So do it now. It's, uh, I mean, it's a good wake-up call and a good slap, I think, for, for some people who, like we said earlier, might have sleepwalked into a position where not, they're not really achieving what they set out to achieve. Um, mm. Michael, tell us about your book. Give us a, to round off. Tell us about your book. Who knew? It, it's, there you go. There it Picture is. My daughter and I, it made it into the Amazon top 10 when it first came out. It's available on Amazon, Booktopia, all the other things and from my website. And it's just an explanation about some of the benefits of uh, involved present uh, engaged fathers. And it's also about some of the barriers that we hit, everything from maternal gatekeeping through to the advertising. It's got the ballet story in there. It's got a lot of uh, research and things like that, but it's mainly about the eight outdated gender expectations that are limiting all of us, men, women, non-binary, and really affecting our children as well. Because as I said, 14% of your child's waking hours between kindergarten and the end of their higher education are in, in school. If we set the expectation and the example and the template for our children of what a respectful, equal relationship works. And I'm not saying that everything has to be 50-50. There's ebbs and flows. Sometimes mum's busy at work, dad takes over. Sometimes dad's busy at work, mum takes over. But it's got to be a choice that's enabled without that stigma or anything else. And it's some it may be, as I say, don't, Dad, please don't go home and steamroll your wife and go, right, well, I'm going to start doing this because it's it's a family thing because not only women find great agency and purpose in uh, childhood. Um, my daughter and I, it was just her and I for five years, I made a point of staying single because I didn't want anyone in and out of her life and I didn't think it was fair on anyone else that I could um, not commit what I would think would be an equivalent amount of time or devotion to a relationship when I wanted to focus on, on my daughter. And I still remember the first weekend, I've got an amazing partner now who had just gotten engaged. And the first weekend that we stayed at her place, normally my daughter and I have this routine where it's a little rest on the throat. Whoever wins has to piggyback the other one. Luckily I, I, I uh, lose all the time. So I've got to piggyback her to the room. And this first night, it was like, no, Dad, I, I want Robin to do it. And it was like a dagger through the heart. I couldn't, yeah. <laughs> couldn't believe it. Like, you're kidding. And then they're in the bedroom, and I'm listening. I'm thinking, why is she going to call me in? It was like nothing. And, and that's why I say to Dad, you've got to realise that you can't just overturn or steamroll the things with, with mums, but also say to mums, don't think dads don't feel marginalised and a little bit hurt when dad calls for mum instead of dad. There, there are some times I'm glad where I'm tired and, you know, Charlie will call for Robin instead of me. But most of the time I find, you know, it's it's such a, um, it, it's not a gendered thing feeling marginalised by your child. Mm. No, well, congratulations on the engagement, by the way. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> all the best with that. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, Michael, it's been absolutely fantastic Um Chatting to you, I, I think your, your your mission is inspirational. You know, you're obviously very passionate about what you believe in, and I think you're you're certainly helping a lot of people. From what I can see, um, with my digital eyes all the way over here in the UK, looking over in Australia. So, so keep it up, and, and thank you very much for for spending time with us today. Hopefully, it'll connect with some dads 
uh, and give them the support and, and perhaps kick up the arse they might need to, to figure out the, the, their responsibilities a bit. So, Michael, um, how can we connect with you and we'll, uh, we'll get it wrapped up? Um, uh, through my website, uh, michaelray.com.au, through LinkedIn, uh, Michael Ray Solo Dad on Facebook and Insta. But LinkedIn's normally where the, I do the most content trying to uh, help people along, Rob. Brilliant. Your kid will be teaching you about Insta and TikTok in no time. <laughs> it already is, Rob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Michael, a pleasure to chat to you. Um, we'll be in touch very soon. And uh, thanks again, mate, for your time. Really appreciate Likewise. it. Likewise. Thanks for the opportunity, Rob.